Glad, glad to be in the house of the Lord on this day. And just a few announcements. Continue to remember the Hands of Mercy Food Bank. You can drop those off during the week. Uh, Bible study will not meet this evening, but Paul told me just a few minutes ago that it will resume on the first Sunday of June, which I believe is the sixth. He's had successful successful cataract surgery, so he's going to be able to see, to read, and study. Uh, he sees more clearly, so that means the Bible study will be more clear, right, Paul? Don't know about that, but anyway. Uh, the study of uh, Daniel will resume uh, this Tuesday at 10 a.m. Uh, we'll have Bible study Wednesday the 26th at 7 in person or on Zoom. You can contact me if you'd like that Zoom link. I'll be happy to send it to you. And the Denomination Day celebration 
will be Sunday the 6th of June at 3.30 in the afternoon at the Beaver Creek Church. And that's over in Powell. If you would like to uh, go to that, they encourage you to wear period costumes and bring a lawn chair because seating is limited. Are there any other announcements that we have this morning? All right. Well, at this time, I want to recognize our graduate our high school graduate, and we're going to call her up front and just embarrass her to death. I can tell she, don't you love me right now, Avery? Come on, honey, you can do it. <laughs> She's going, oh gosh, he's serious. <laughs> See, they're not afraid. You shouldn't be either. Now, I've known Avery since she was a little bitty one, and we've grown to love her and see her grow in the Lord and in so many ways, and it's a blessing that, uh, I don't know what he said, <laughs> it's a blessing that uh, she's graduated high school, and you can look on the slide up there, she's not just graduated by the skin of her teeth, you know, varsity cheer, Beta Club, uh, she graduated summa cum laude when most of us here graduated, thank the laude, right? <laughs> you know, and uh, graduating with distinction, and she plans to attend that wonderful institution over in Knoxville, the University of Tennessee. And we're just thankful for you, and we want to uh, give you a copy of, of the scriptures, and for you, and can we have a prayer? Can I put my little hand on your shoulder or my big hand? <laughs> Gracious God, we thank you and praise you uh, for your son. Right now we pray for Avery as she takes these next steps in her life. Fill her with your wisdom, your joy, your peace, and your knowledge in all the decisions that she makes, that she might live for you and honor you until the day of your son's return. It's in his name we pray. Amen. And you can see up there, we have also have a couple other graduates, uh, Doug and Linda Allen's grandson, Austin Ryder, graduated from Tech with a degree in music. If you need a band director at your school somewhere, call, call him, he'll, he'll do you a good job. Also, uh, Charlie and Lois's granddaughter, Caitlin, she graduated from East Tennessee State, and now she's smarter than me, I know, going to pursue a degree in pharmacy at pharmacy school. Our catechism question for the week is what is required in the fifth commandment? The fifth commandment requires children to honor their parents and to obey them in all things lawful. And you can see the scripture references there. And now, may the peace of Christ be with you. Let's pass the peace now. knows how to pass the peace. That's how you do it, with the joy of the Lord in your heart. Let's stand together and join in our call to worship. If you, O oh Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. There is hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. And he will redeem us from all our iniquities. Father, we thank you that you do indeed redeem us from all of our sin and from all of our iniquities because of your steadfast love. We come this morning and just bow down before you in adoration and in praise for that steadfast love. In your name we pray. Amen. Our praise chorus this morning is Sweet, Sweet Spirit, and it's number 391.
sounding good this morning, and we'll move on to 408, How Firm a Foundation. Affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. is the spirit song it's number 384 and we're singing about the spirit this morning because this is Pentecost Sunday when the Holy Spirit came down number 384 
Just a reminder, our noisy offering this month goes to the Cumberland Presbyterian Children's Home in, in Texas, Denton, Texas, I believe it is, and they do great ministry there. And the noisy offering can is next to the door along with our regular offering plates. Uh, prayer requests and praise reports, just a word of praise about uh, Steve Hooser. He has had a successful surgery for cancer, and uh, he's now at home with home health care, and we need to continue to pray for his recovery because he's got uh, a long way to go. Word of praise for all of our graduates, for Avery and for Austin and for Caitlin, all the hard work that went into that, and can praise for that and continued prayer. And also, uh, we need to pray for the family of Melissa Rose in in her passing, uh, Richard saw that earlier today, so many of you probably know who that is, so be in prayer for her family. Are there any other prayer requests or praise reports this morning? Yes. It's good to see you back here, Jerry. Good to, good to have you here. Anyone else? Yeah, Paul. Yes. Continue to pray for Aaron Lacey then, who's in uh, back in trauma ICU and uh, with an infection, and hopefully he can recover and they can do surgery very soon. Is there anyone else? Beth. I'm thankful that Lori is back, safe and sound. Amen. 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 Safe and sound and healing. That's right. God has been very good to us. Anyone else? Richard. Uh, Brian Carter uh, had to make a quick trip to the emergency room in Springfield, Illinois on their vacation. Uh, but he's out and fine now. So Brian Carter. Yeah, he had some kind of infection. Went to the ER, but, but it's fine now. Okay. Learn all sorts of things on Facebook, don't you, Richard? Yep. <laughs> Yes, Dan. Uh, this week I was talking with Mel Carney, and he's got several medical conditions that some are very serious. Okay, let's remember Melvin Carney with several medical issues. Thank you, Dan. Anyone else? Well, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you and we praise you for your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we come this morning and we just uh, exalt his name and hope to bring honor to him. Lord, we come also confessing our sins to you. Lord, help us to do so. Help us to remember as we confess our sins that you are the one who heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Lord, and we, we thank you for that healing. We thank you for that uh, grace in our lives. And we confess our sins to you now in light of that healing and grace. Sins that grieve us, sins that separate us from your presence in our lives. Sins, Father, that separate us from one another. Lord, we have been envious of our brother or sister. We, we have uh, been the source of arguments and strife. Lord, we, we have used our tongues in unkind ways. Father, forgive us of those things. And we confess those things to you, Father, and all of our sins even now. And we ask your forgiveness 
the forgiveness that comes through your son, Jesus Christ, who bore our sins in his body upon the cross. And we thank you for that. And Lord, we come this morning in that forgiveness and in that grace at your bidding, Father, to lift up these prayer requests to you. Father, we praise you for so many things this morning. A praise for, for graduates, a praise for a successful surgery, for Jerry Roberts and Steve, Steve Hoosier. And Father, we just thank you for that. And Lord, we lift up these prayer requests for people who are facing uh, surgeries and healing. Father, for Aaron Lacey and and uh, and and uh, Melvin Carney and his medical issues. Father, we just pray for both of them. And Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that he works and that he moves in each of these lives and each of these hearts. And now, Lord, we ask that as your people, we might live as a witness for you. Lord, in our relationships, help us to stop holding on to any unforgiveness that might be there. Lord, forgive us of taking those offenses, Father, and rehearsing them in our minds, running them over and over again, Lord, because all that does is, is embed that hatred and unforgiveness and bitterness into our hearts. So, Lord, help us to forgive as we have been forgiven, to let our minds dwell on whatever is good, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, and whatever is of good report, Father, help us to think on those things. Lord, teach us to be patient instead of petty, compassionate instead of critical, merciful instead of mean, gracious and kind and not gossipy. Lord, help us to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness in all things. And may we seek your kingdom more than we seek our own way more than we seek to be right, and even more than we seek to avoid pain. Help us to remember, Father, that it's your glory and your kingdom that matters the most, and not ours. Lord, teach us to love and honor and forgive one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And now, Lord, we close this prayer with the prayer that your blessed and holy Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Pete Dawson. Talented young man, you see him running from the organ to the piano and, and does the trombone and who knows what else. I'm sure Kaylee could tell us what else he does. It's not so nice, couldn't you, Kaylee? <laughs> oh, me. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 1, beginning in the first verse. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to you this morning and we seek your mercy. We seek your grace to, to come before your word with hearts that are mold, moldable, hearts that are pliable. Lord, take these old hearts of stone and give us a heart of flesh. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, last Sunday, basically an introdu introduction to this letter to the Hebrews, we talked about the Lord's dire warnings that we find here. And I sort of had some leftover thoughts about those dire warnings and did a little research. And have you ever thought about those warnings that on the side of things that we have these days that are just plain silly? Have you ever thought about those? Like... Um, there's a warning on the side of a Superman Halloween costume. And the warning reads, this costume does not enable flight or super strength. Which means that somebody tried to jump off a building somewhere, right? And then there's the warning on a 3 8 inch drill that says, this product not intended for use as a dental drill. Well, come here, cousin. Let me help you with that, you know. So, golly. And then... Then there's a label on a carton of a dozen eggs. Warning, this product may contain eggs. And you open it up and guess what's in there? <laughs> you say, oh, that's what those things are. You're, or on Nitol, which is Nitol One Night Sleep Aid, and it says, warning, this product may cause drowsiness. <laughs> I hope it does. I think that's what it's for. But anyway, I found those slightly humorous, and but the dire warnings, the eternal warnings that we receive here in Hebrews are, they involve eternal consequences. You know, we are to pay more careful attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away, that we, we need to anchor ourselves in the word of God lest we drift away from God. As we said, these are Last week, talking about Hebrews, these are real warnings for real people who apparently made real professions of faith. And so, how do we ensure that we do not drift? Where do we anchor? We anchor, as I just said, to Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. Well, who is he? How, how do we know him when we see him to keep our eyes upon him? Uh, we talked about that a lot in our studies in 1 John, about how John is the one who told us that Jesus is God incarnate, that he is very God of very God, that it is the Jesus that's provided for us within the pages of Scripture, not some other Jesus. It is the Jesus that, as John says in the prologue to his gospel, that was the Word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. We read in 1 John that he saw him with his own eyes, he heard Jesus with his own ears, he touched Jesus with his own hands. He is the one who went to the cross and purchased the forgiveness of our sins. That's who Jesus is, and unless he is the very divine Son of God, his death upon the cross is tragic, but it does not redeem us. So we must have and must believe these things. And the writer to Hebrews tells us 
in the same vein as John does, he gives us seven truths in these opening verses, seven truths about Jesus, seven truths that we need to pay more careful attention to, seven truths that will help us answer the question, who is Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? And we'll try to go through these things fairly quickly. Number one, he is the heir of all things. That's in verse two. He is the heir of all things. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. In other words, and I like the way one commentator said it. He said it this way, from all eternity and thus at the very creation when time began, God made his son the heir of all things, not according to his deity, which could inherit nothing, but according to his humanity, which could inherit and did inherit all things. So it's quite clear. He's the heir of all things. When, when the angel comes to Mary and declares the wonder of everything that's about to take place in her life in Luke one thirty two, the angel said he, speaking of Jesus, he said he will be great and he will be called the son of the most high and the Lord will give him. Give him. The Lord will give him. He will inherit the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever in his kingdom will never end. So when Jesus, and when Jesus stands in, uh, in the closing days of his earthly ministry and he talks to the people there in the temple and the people are questioning him as to who he is, he says in John 16, all that belongs to the Father is mine. Everything that belongs to God the Father is mine. And so these notions of a contemporary, uh, that these contemporary notions about Christ, that he was some sort of guru, that he was some sort of a, a mystical figure, a kind man, a generous man, and a loving man who showed us how to be kind and generous and loving and unselfish, all of that stuff has to bow down before the clear instruction of, G, of the Scripture. So who is Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? He is the heir of all things. You read in Psalm 2, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Here we see that God the Father promises to give to God the Son the ends of the earth as a possession. The psalm, I think it's the 50th Psalm says that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Beloved, this is why we, we need to know our Bible. This is why we need to know doctrine. This is why we need to know these things because when I'm weary, when I'm filled with fear, when I'm filled with despair, when, when the circumstances of this life, you know, they just bear down on you and they fit, you feel like they just crush you and they crush the people you love, and you see everybody going through these things, when you get afraid of the future and you're fearful of all those things, and I, you know, where do we go? What do we do? We go to Christ. We go to Christ, who is the heir of all things. He's the one who owns the whole deal. So when the news tells you that the stock market is tanking or that your Social Security won't be there when you get to the age that you need it, or, or, and, or you, you say, well, I understand all of that. But you know, Romans 8, 17 tells me that I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the heir of all things. You know what? He owns this whole shooting match, doesn't he? He owns everything. Second, he is God's creative agent. The whole created universe of time and space was made by God through the Son of God. That's what it says at the end of the verse 2, isn't it? Through whom he also created the world. That's similar to the prologue of John's Gospel, John 1, 3. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Paul writes to the church in Colossae, Colossians 1, 16. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Now, some of the commentaries, they try to explain how the miracles of Jesus never really happened because in their view, in their view, uh, they don't want sensible people like you and, and me to be confused by the preposterous claim that some Galilean carpenter could actually turn water into wine 
or take five loaves and a couple of fish and feed five or 10,000 people. And so they write all of this nonsense and they say things like, you know, as soon as the little boy gave his lunch to Jesus, you know what happened? Everybody saw that little boy give away his lunch, so they reached into their pocket or their purse or their bag and they started giving away all of their food and Jesus so, showed how to give and before you know it, everybody was fed. You know, and it was, it's not really a miracle, but we'll call it a miracle. You know why? Because we like Jesus and it'll make Jesus look good. What a bunch of nonsense. Amen. What a bunch of nonsense. If he is the creative agent behind the entire universe, what's lunch? What's lunch for five or 10,000 people? He created everything. And you see, loved ones, this is where many people, this is where many of us stumble in this scientific age. We're told over and over again. If I've heard it once, I've heard it 10,000 times over the past few months. Follow the science. You know, and they're talking about the COVID. And that's true as far as it goes. And they want you to follow the science in all of your life. And that is true as far as it goes. But you know what? They don't know everything. The only person who knows everything is the divine creator of the universe. And the scripture tells us to follow him. So we must bring our mind underneath the authority of the truth of God's word. The scripture has to be our starting point. All of our science must be posited on these truths, the truths of the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that you have to put your brain in neutral to be a Christian and to have faith because being a Christian is the most rational and sensible thing that anyone could ever do, in my opinion. I'm saying this, this is what I'm saying, that the truths of the scripture do not fight for acceptance on the basis of our scientific theories. God isn't in the business of arguing with, the, with science. In fact, he isn't in the business of arguing with anybody. Once somebody asked Spurgeon, you know, what do you do with everybody tearing down the word of God and tearing down the lion of the tribe of Judah? And he said, well, you know how a lion defends itself? Just let it out of its cage. Let it out of its cage. Let the word of God speak for itself. You see, at the end of the day, I believe when the brightest scientific minds have had the codes cracked for them, they will be on their knees before Jesus Christ and declare him the Lord of the entire universe. So let the scientists say what they want to say, and there's no need for us to be buffeted or beaten down by all of that. Just understand this, that the Jesus to whom you have committed your life is the heir of all things. He is the one who created the universe. And you know what? You know him personally. And you know what's even better? He knows your name. The creator of the universe knows your name. Third, he is the radiance of the glory of God. Who is this Jesus? He's the radiance of the glory of God. The glory of God was visible, a visible expression of the presence of God. And you get that in the Old Testament. And you can read about it, I believe, in Exodus chapter 33. And the writer of Hebrews tells us here, listen, all of God's greatness and all of his majesty shines through his Son. Christ is the light of God burning and shining John in his prologue, once again, and we have seen his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Jesus Christ is the glorious light of God that shines into the hearts of men and of women. We would never be able to see God. We would never be able to enjoy God's light if we didn't have Jesus. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of of life. Friends, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, and he can place that light into your life. He can place it into my life. And why does he do that? So that we can radiate that light to all that we meet. We can radiate that light to a lost and dying world. And we live in a dark world, don't we? It's a dark world, a world that's filled with the darkness of failure, the darkness of separation, the darkness of injustice, the darkness of the disease and death, and the list could go on. Then there's moral darkness, men and women who are blinded by their own selfish, godless desires. And into this dark world, God sent his glorious light. That's what he's done. Without the Son of God, there's only darkness, only darkness. 
Fourth, he is the exact representation or imprint of his nature. This, verse 3, this is the, the, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact imprint of his nature. The sun, we're told, truly and fully shows the character of God. When we see, see what the sun is like, we see exactly what God is. Is like that's why Jesus said to people when you have seen me you have seen the father John 1 18 no one has ever seen God but God the one and only who is at the father's side has made him known Jesus has made him known you see there's no private side to God and somehow that's somehow obscured by this public image that he puts out there no, that's not what goes on. He has been fully revealed in Christ. The true character and the full character of God is open and clear and on display to us to see in Jesus Christ. All of God's greatness and all of his majesty shines through the sun. He is, Jesus is, that bright and burning light of God. Finally, or fifthly, he upholds the universe. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. He's not only the inheritor of the universe, not only is the one who created the entire universe, but he at this very moment is upholding everything. He's upholding everything by his powerful word. Paul says in Colossians 1.17 that in him all things hold together. Now, you know, what would happen? Well, you know, you remember that song? I can't remember. You probably, everybody probably remember. You know, Jesus, take the wheel. I got news for you. He's always had the wheel. He doesn't need to take the wheel. He is the one who is upholding everything. And what would happen if he took his hand off the wheel for even a moment? Think about it. The sun's uh, surface temperature is 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. If we were too close, we'd burn up. Too far away, we would freeze to death. If the glo our globe is tilted at an angle of 23 degrees, which provides four seasons for us. If it was not tilted at this angle, vapors from the, from the oceans would move north and south and they would develop monstrous continents of ice. If the moon did not maintain its exact distance from the earth, ocean tides would flood all of the land twice a day. And after the first one, we wouldn't care because we'd be gone. You know, and that would happen twice a day. If the ocean floors were merely a few feet deeper than they are, carbon dioxide and oxygen, they would be out of balance and no animal life would exist and no plant life could exist. Now, how does the universe maintain this fantastically delicate balance? How does that happen? Jesus Christ sustains it. Jesus Christ monitors it. He upholds it all by the word of his power. He is sovereignly in control. Beloved, things didn't happen by chance in the beginning. Things are not going to happen by chance at the end. And, at, and they're not happening by chance at this very moment in your life. Beloved, if Jesus can uphold and sustain the entire universe by the word of his power, I believe that he can and that he will and that he does sustain you in whatever circumstance you might be facing this morning. And nothing in your life happens by accident, whether it's for good or for ill. Our Lord is sovereign. He is in control, and he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Trust him. Trust him. Put yourself in his almighty, loving hands. You know, Jesus demonstrated that this world was under his control while he was here. You remember one night, that one day, the disciples, he and the disciples got in a boat and they launch off onto the Sea of Galilee and then a storm breaks out and the, and the waves are coming over the boat and the disciples are in fear that where their boat's going to come over, they're all going to drown. And where's Jesus? He's asleep in the back on a pillow. And they go and they shake him awake, they shake him awake, and Lord, don't you care that we're about to drown? And I can see Jesus get up, rub the sleep out of his eyes, walk onto the deck, look around, and he says, Hey, hush, be quiet. And then there was a great calm, the scriptures tell us. And the disciples looked at each other and said, What manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? 
Who is he? He's the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power. That's who he is. Isn't that good to know? Isn't that good to know? Sixth, he is the one who has provided purification for our sins. He shifts, the writer does, from creation and sustaining, uh, and he is ceaselessly God's glory. He's continuously sustaining all things, but when he's on the cross, he gave himself up there. He did so at one moment in time, as it were. And we'll get more deeply into this as we go further on. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 27 says, Unlike the other high priests, he doesn't need to offer sacrifices day after day. He sacrificed himself for sins once for all when he offered himself. No repetition necessary. No substitution is possible. He is God's unrepeatable sacrifice for sin. The scriptures tell us that the wages of sin is death. Jesus Christ, he went to the cross. He died the death that you and I deserve. And in his death, he took the penalty for our sin upon himself. If we by grace through faith turn to him and, and believe in him and in his death, he will set us free from that penalty of sin. He will wipe away the stain of our sin and purge us of our guilt before him. And then finally, this Jesus is seated. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The most wonderful part of that little statement is, is that he sat down. He sat down. The Old Testament priest never sat down. If you read about how that, the temple and the tabernacle were made, there aren't any seats there because they couldn't sit down. The priest had no place to sit because his responsibility was to sacrifice, 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 and then when he was finished with that, he could sacrifice some more because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Over and over again, he had to do that so that the sins of the people could be forgiven, and they offered those sacrifices daily and never sat. But when Jesus offered one sacrifice, he said what? It is finished. When he sat down at the right hand of the Father, it was done. He did, Jesus did, what the Old Testament priests could never do through countless sacrifices throughout the century, centuries. His sacrifice was sufficient. His sacrifice is complete. And you look at all of these and I think they have cosmic significance because you're talking about the creation of the world. You're talking about Jesus as the sustainer of the universe. And that's more than I can comprehend to think about that, to be quite honest. And all I have to do, and I don't know about you, but you go out and you look at the night sky. You ever done that? Go out and look at the night sky and you feel about yay tall or yay small. And I think about the 19th Psalm, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Or Psalm, Psalm 8, you know, when I look at the heavens, uh, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have placed, put in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? What am I that you are mindful of me, that you sent your son as a sacrifice for my sin. Who am I? Who am I in all of this? And I think of that old chorus. I don't know who wrote it. It took a miracle to hang the stars in space. It took a miracle to put the world in place. But when he saved my soul, when he cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and of grace especially when he set his hand on an old drifter like me. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you are omnipotent, that you are great, that you are powerful, Father, that you are the creator and the sustainer of this universe, that you are our creator. You are the one who sustains us. So, Father, we just thank you for that. It is a truth that is too wonderful for us to understand. 
the miracle of your creation and the miracle of our redemption in your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Closing hymn is number 489, Pass Me Not. And let's stand, please. Father, we thank you and praise you that you have never passed by anyone who humbly cries out to you and who seeks you, that you are the redeemer of all who do so. And we thank you and praise you for that. We thank you and praise you for who you are, our creator and our sustainer. Lord, help us to not drift from your grace, but to ever hold on to you. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be all glory, majesty, dominion, and power from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>